in April of 1980, which was a very long time ago, in a little church on Hook Street in Tuscumbia, Alabama, the northwest corner of Alabama. I was about six months old in the Lord. I hadn't had, you know, I just, all this was so new to me. The gospel wasn't raised up in church, so it was all just like, wow. I didn't, I mean, how could I go all these years of my life and not, not pick up on what's in this book? A man came and preached seven nights. He actually started on Sunday morning. And he preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, through Friday night, on seven sayings from the cross. I didn't even know Jesus said anything at the cross. That's just how uh, uh, uneducated that I was when it came to the gospel. And so I, I listened. And here, here as a young man, I, I soaked it up. I was talking to my pastor on the way here, as I always do on Sunday morning. And I told him, I said, those words changed my life. Because I remember I listened, and I came back on Monday and Tuesday. And it wasn't just a small crowd, just a couple of pews worth of people showed up. But, man, I had to hear what this man had to say. And we walked through the cross and got all the way to the, to the end. To, uh, it is finished. And, and it, it, was, it was that moment when I said, you know what? I'm going to go to college. I'm going to learn this book. And I want to preach the gospel the rest of my life. And I, as a young man, just fix, you know, I'm fixing to turn, get into my 20s now. I, I thought, I, that's what I want to do. I believe the word of God can change your destiny, can turn everything around in your life. I mean, can shift. You could come to church. And that's why it's so important to be able to hear the word of God, whether you're hearing it online or here. I, you know, I, I love to have you here. It's something about being personal, but I also understand how that works. Uh, but Luke chapter 22, are you comfortable? Let's do 23. Let's start at verse 26. As they led him away, and if you were here during the midweek service, you know we've already talked about the court, what happened to him there, and, and reversing the curse. And as they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and they put the cross on him, and they made him carry it behind Jesus. So again, it's been a long night. There's been a lack of sleep. There's been trials. There's been mockery. The loss of blood in the garden. The scourgings. The beating that he took. The plucking of his beard. The spitting in his face. Now Simon the Cyrene is summoned to carry the cross for Christ. Look down to verse 27. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem... Do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Father, I thank you for your word. I ask your anointing, your help on my life, Lord, to speak. Lord, as if I've never spoke on it before, let new revelation come up. Let understanding of this time as we move through this time of the cross. Lord, it's what we've endured that shows how much we, we want something. And you endured the cross for the joy that was set before you. Help us also to endure this life. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You may be seated. Uh, when I use that word endure, one of the things that really hits me is that and again, you have to ride a motorcycle for an extended amount of time to understand what I'm saying. But there comes a time when you get this little burn in the buttocks. And uh, when it hits, you, got to, you shift and you move and you do all kinds of things, but you, you, it doesn't matter. You have to endure it. And I, I was riding yesterday, and, all I, and, and, and I don't want to make this not light at all, but it, it, it's painful, but you've you got to keep pressing past that and then there comes a place of okay I can handle it I thought about Jesus from nine o'clock till three o'clock and I just begin to meditate on the cross and it's like my pain goes away when I think of all the things that he went through and on his way to the Calvary and I, I, I they took the cross from him and gave it to Simon the Cyrene I believe that he really wanted to hold on to the cross I don't read where he ever fell 
By the way, when you watch the movies, you'll see where Jesus fell care. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus fell carrying his cross. Amen. He, he came for the cross. He wanted the cross. For this reason, I came. He made that statement. So I don't believe he went down to his knees or anything. I think they took the cross from him. They put it on Simon. And Simon begins to carry it. And Jesus there. And he sees these women. He said, don't, don't weep for me. Don't weep. And, and you say, what? what? What do you mean? I, I like a little. No, no sympathy here. I came for this. This is why I'm here. So don't, don't look at me and weep for me. Weep for yourself. Now, as, as a young Bible student, I remember listening to this, and I thought, okay, something bad's going to happen later on in life. In my life, I'm going to pick up on it. But some things have already taken place in history. When Jesus said this, when he said they, they began to weep for him, don't weep for me, weep for yourself. The Jews became more and more rebellious, and they revolted against Caesar and the Roman authority. In 67 A.D., Nero appoints Vespasian, his son, in charge of Judea, who brings several legions and begins a slow and methodical campaign of destruction of the Jews from the city uh, that lasted two years. It's hard to imagine a city being in siege for two years to where there's no food going in, there's nothing coming out, and they begin to starve themselves to the point where they literally were turning into cannibals. I'll just leave it at that. In 70 A.D., believers in the city and the country, knowing in the warnings and having witnessed the surrounding of Jerusalem, left for the mountains before Titus set his siege. Rome under Titus for four years, they locked them in. The atrocities were so bad, Luke uh, chapter 21, verse 20, Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its ice desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those in the city get out and let those in the country not enter the city. The reason I mention this is there are those today, they, they read scripture like this and they're waiting on Jerusalem to get surrounded. Jerusalem's already been surrounded. Jerusalem's all, this has already happened in history. Will it happen again? It could happen again. But understand this, for this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be for those days for the pregnant women, nursing mothers. There will be great distress in the land, wrath against the people. So in 70 AD, the total number of dead was over 1.1 million. 1.1 million people died of starvation. Titus seized the city at Passover when it was filled with visitors for worship, and there were only 97,000 that were taken captive. In 70 AD, no individual city had ever endured such pain. During World War II, it was, it was modest in comparison. For, for example, Hiroshima only lost around 100,000 people. Most of them died instantly. Here, a million one died. So now we got Jesus up to Golgotha. It's Friday morning, 9 a.m. It's killing time. Outside the Damascus Gate is a road, and on the other side of the road is that flat area near the spot where the prophet Jeremiah was buried. Up above is a rocky outcropping that if you study it at a certain look, you'll, you'll see at a certain angle it looks like a skull. You can see eroded in the limestone, two sockets but for the eyes, a place for the nose, and maybe a place for the mouth. Skull Hill, many called it, Golgotha. It was a place where the Romans did their killing. And Friday... Friday 9 o'clock was killing time. As they bring Jesus up, it's going to be an easier morning. He's already been weakened. He's already been beaten. He'll die very quick, they're thinking. Two other prisoners. It's kind of a light day, if you would call it, for the Romans. They're ready for this. On this particular Friday morning, their workload, again, a little bit light. Only three this week. And then the mob psychology kicked in. At 9 a.m. and up the road comes a group of people. There's something sordid. There's something twisted in our mentality that we like to see people suffer. You say, no, Pastor, no, no, listen. In this YouTube era, it's funny how many times we go on to watch a wreck. How many times we go on to watch somebody be in, in a fight, the MMA, all these things. We have this, this thing about it. So here's the mob gathering to watch what's going to happen there. Here, here the, the, the lowest of the lows seem to gather there. Here, here we find that one of the men comes up from the north. Amen. As, as he moves on there, the people of Jerusalem, at least some of them, love to come out and see the crucifixions. Well, may, maybe they didn't love it, but they couldn't stay away from it. It was one of them things that you had to just keep looking at. Some strange magnetic force drew them up to the skull hill. Up the road comes a parade of people led by a brawny foreigner carrying a cross. That couldn't be the one they were going to crucify. It turns out he was the man by the name of Simon. The crowd swirls around, and behind him is a stooped figure, a man not quite six feet tall. Now walking, each step in agony to behold 
half man, half creature from the worst nightmare you've ever had. He had been beaten within an inch of his life. His back was in shreds. His front was covered with the markings of the whip. His face was disfigured and swollen where they had ripped out his beard by the roots. And on his head, a crown of thorns, six inches stuck down under the skin, a shell of a man, a man already more dead than alive. When the fellows on the crucifixion detail saw that, well, they weren't unhappy because they knew it wouldn't take long. He moved, he moaned, he didn't do much. One hand over here, one hand over there, wrapping rope around his arm, and again, rope around his legs, probably bent and partially resting on a small platform. They drove the spike on the forearm, side of the wrist, so that when the weight of the cross fell, the spike wouldn't rip through the hand, a spike in both wrists, and then a spike through the legs. With the ropes in place, they began to pull the cross up. Jesus now spurting blood from his raw wounds. Steady now, boys, steady. Don't drop it. And as they're lifting it up, it was a terrible thing. You can't drop the cross because you can't just do that. If you drop it too hard, he could yank him off of there. So they set it up, and there was Jesus, naked and exposed before the world, beaten, bruised, bloody, the soldier stood back, satisfied, a job well done. Somebody said, get the dice. Let's roll for the clothes he has left. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with them to be executed. Verse 32, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. His hands used to heal. That broke the bread, blessed the children. The place of consecrated nerves drove a spike through the muscle in his nerves. His feet used to carry the good news. There's no Novocaine at the cross. There's no painkillers. There's nothing you could do to stop the head the, 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 from being beat down by the sun, the blood moving down his body his back he now he's got a title over his head there was written a notice above him this is the king of the jews the chief priest requested the wording be changed from fact to claim verse 19 uh chapter 19 verse 19 somebody say fake news uh-huh amen Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross it read jesus of nazareth the king of the jews many of the jews read the sign and the place where jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in aramaic latin and greek the chief priest of the jews protested to Pilate, don't write the king of the jews but but that this man claimed to be the king that that would have been fake he is the king of the jews and Pilate said what i've written i've written it amazes me that somebody being tortured beat crucified and then it still wasn't enough for the, for the social people, the, the preachers of the, time, of the time, saying, no, he said he was. They're trying to justify him, themselves. And then his last words. Everybody say his last words. Your last words on this planet are going to be the most important words you ever share. Whether you write them in a will, whether you say them to a loved one, but your last words are very, very important. We long to hear the last words of someone that we have loved, someone that we've cared about. Crucified at 9 o'clock, taken down at 3 o'clock, six hours on the cross. The first three utterances demonstrated the love of God. His first prayer was not for himself, but for his murderers. This, you know, Jesus starts out strong. He finishes strong. I've said it. Your genesis determines your revelation. How you start. It's how you're going to finish. When he started his ministry, he started it strong. But he had one thing on his mind, and that was the cross. He pressed toward the cross. Everything he did moved him toward the cross. He knew it was coming. Oh, he tried to shake it in the garden, but he just couldn't do it. And when he got there, it's the love that's inside of him for the people. It demonstrated how much he loved them. When he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If I walked down from this platform, walked over and gave you a nice backhand slap, you, you would never forget me the rest of your life. Oh, you would be upset. It would sting. It would be embarrassing. It would be so embarrassing for the pastor to walk down and just slap you. Travis, just a really, I mean, so hard that, that, that your head hits Jody's head. It, well, no, no, I'm just saying. That happened to me in a church once where a pastor was trying to uh, represent his point. And he came over and he slapped me. And I remember the sting on my face. And I was young in the Lord. I mean, I, I wasn't as mature as I am now. But he was trying to prove his point. That, that there's a time that somebody hits you. You're, you're going to be mad at Oh, I was. I was very mad at him. I mean, I, in some ways I was kin to him. But that wouldn't stop me from slipping in some night and hitting him back. And when I think about the beating that Jesus took on the cross, 
And by the way, see, I mentioned that. You know why? Because I never forgot it. I just one of them things, I, and I'll never slap you. That's not what I want, I'm here to do. Because you, no, well, that just ain't right. I told him after church, I don't care. You need to find another way to prove your point. <laughs> you slap the wrong people I know, they're going to hit you back real quick. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His first statement. Father, addressed to his dad, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm not here to justify me or you. I believe a lot of times we know what we're doing. But then there are times I believe that heaven looks down. Tuesday and Wednesday night, I mentioned to you that there were scribes that Jesus said to the, to the preachers of the day that he would be in, on the right hand of the mighty God. When you understand his trial, there's a judge, there's a scribe on the left. The scribe on the left always hands out judgment he always hands out uh, uh, the, uh, the the time sentence or what's going to happen and then the scribe on the right always handed out pardons when jesus said when i get home i'm going to be sitting on the right side and on the right side is where i hand out pardons that upset them because he set himself up as god at that moment i've given out forget i'm not the one handing out judgment i'm the one handing out pardons i'm the one that's going to be forgiven you of this so when i read this father forgive them for they don't know what they do uh, and they divided his clothes by casting lots the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him they said he saved others let him save himself if he is the christ the chosen one the soldier came up and mocked him they offered him wine vinegar and said if you are the king of the jews save yourself as they drove the spikes father as they dropped him into the hole father as they uncovered him father as they sniggered and mocked him father he prayed for his murderers he took took our sin. Isaiah 53 12 says, therefore I will give him the prophecy over a thousand years before he came. I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto the death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The message Bible says it like this. I love it. Therefore I'll reward him what, what you're going to go through, Christ? What you're going to go through, my son? I'm going to reward you extravagantly. The best of everything. The highest honors. Because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of the black sheep. Any black sheep in the church? I said any black sheep in the church? He took up our cause. He stood up for us. And when I read this, I'm thinking, this is, this is who I want to follow. This is the one who forgives, the one who loves. And the Bible says when he got home, it was extravagant. It was a, God honored him in such a way because he stared death in the face and he didn't flinch. Each utterance spoken with the utmost difficulty and pain. The only way for him to speak was to push himself up on the spike, to gain enough air inside of him to speak out. I know, can you imagine only saying something? seven things in six hours being awake some of you talk more than that in your sleep so seven times he made up his mind what he would say he lifted up his head he looked at the people who had beat him crucified him drove spikes in him and said father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing there were two men on each side of him, which we're very familiar with. They were crucified on the outer crosses, differed on one main point, how they viewed the man in the middle. They saw him differently and therefore asked him for different things. One man wanted escape, not forgiveness. Some of us, we want relief, but we don't want forgiveness. The other man wanted forgiveness. He wasn't looking for escape. If death is what I'm here to take, one guy asked to be take, take, get us down from here. The other guy said, hey, I'm ready to die. If I need to die, let me die. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus then, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth today. Somebody say today. Say it again. Today you'll be with me in paradise. This is made more amazing when you consider that this man had none of the advantages the disciples or we had. He never heard Jesus teaching. 
by the seashore. He never saw Jesus heal the sick or raise the dead. He knew nothing of Jesus' great parables. He never saw any of his miracles. This man missed all the outward signs of Jesus' kingship, and yet he asked, remember me. Remember me. Do you know what your biggest fear is? I don't even know all of you, but one of your biggest fears is to not be remembered. To know that you walked on this planet, you were here 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, maybe in your now, and nobody remembered you. Nobody brought you back up. Well, one of the things that I, I'm compelled to do, Sister Havard, is remember Brother Havard. Uh, remember Ron Gant. I, I, I look over our congregation. I see people I have missed. I love, and I, I bring their names up. I still have their names in my phone. I don't take their name out. I'll flip through my phone periodically, and I want to make, I want to call them up. I just want to see if their phone's still on or something of that nature. I've carried in my phone the messages from people who have passed that, that I still have on my phone. It's just those, one of those are the hard things to get rid of because you want to be remembered. Can I encourage you? Do something to be remembered for. Love people. Forgive people. Live like Christ did. Leave a legacy. Make sure that when you leave this place, it mattered that you were here. You don't have to give me an amen. I can amen me. I said I didn't have to have it. I just, I can do me. Amen. I just mean it. I want to be remembered for the right things. Amen. A promise has three parts here. I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. In other words, immediate salvation. The day you said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash over me and, and accept me as your child. Immediately he forgave you. He didn't set you up to have you have, that you had to work through it or do anything else. It was immediate. The word there actually means today is the first word in the Greek, which Jesus put in for three, uh, three for, for there for emphasis. Today you will be with me in paradise, meaning this very day, the day of your crucifixion, whatever or whenever paradise is, Jesus told the thief that he was going to be there with him. Personal salvation. Again, the Greek words are very important. The phrase is met uh, met emul, which means to be with me in a very personal way. It is not you over there and me over here, but you and me together, side by side. It means to be in the personal presence of another person. Wherever Jesus was going, the thief would be right beside him. I don't know how this is going to be possible. We don't know how it's going to be possible because there's so many individuals. How is Jesus? You know, Dick mentioned, I, I think everybody's going to get a hug from Jesus. Well, that's good. But how many do I want to hang out with him? I want to walk with him. I want to hear him talk to me. I want to hear if his voice in heaven sounds like what I hear on earth. I, I, I want to I know more about the Bible stories. I want to know more about when he was here. What was you doing before you showed up here? All of these things. How many know there's more than just three years of his life? He's eternal word. He's always been. So I want to know. So when I read this, it, it's like it's very personal. I'm going to get to hang out with him. And again, it's not up to me to figure out how. I don't have to try to figure out the how. I just know that it can happen. And then kingdom salvation. The word paradise. Don't let it don't make you stumble here. In the, it's, a, it's a crucial word. The scholars tell us that it is originally referred to the walled gardens of the Persian kings. When a king wanted to honor his subjects, he would invite them to walk with him in his garden in the cool of the day. This same word was used in the Greek Old Testament to refer to the Garden of Eden in the book of Revelation. It is the place of beauty, openness, and inexpressible blessedness. One thing that I have learned, you come on up here, uh, Josiah. One of the things I've learned in life is this, walk with me. I will say it to people. They'll come up and want to talk to me, and I'm on my way somewhere. And I'll say, walk with me. And they'll walk with me, and we'll share on the way, because then it becomes more personal. I'm not in a crowd. I'm with that person. I think it's a great tool for you to use with your children, with your grandkids, with your friends. Walk with me. Just take a walk with me. And you're on your way to whatever you're doing, and then you're able to talk. I, I realize that it just, it just happens just through the gospel that I asked for you to walk. Listen, if you take these three promises together, you see what a remarkable thing Jesus is saying. He's promising that this thief, he's lived his entire life as a thief, as a rebellion, maybe not his entire life. I think I can prove to you that he wanted the right things, that he was a man who was involved with a guy named, uh, what was it, Barabbas. He was a man involved in insur insurrection, a revolt. I believe he's one of those. 
And upon his death, he's going to be transferred to heaven. He will be in the personal presence of Christ. The thief received much, much more than he asked for. What a day this was for the misbegotten criminal. In the morning, he's in prison. At noon, he's hanging on a cross. By sundown, he's in paradise. Who of you can say, I've lived a terrible life. I'm not asking you that. I'm saying if you understood. You lived a terrible life. But if you knew in the next six hours, you were going to be with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you'd be in paradise. The first trophy of divine grace wasn't a king. It wasn't a prince. It wasn't a queen. My friend, it was the soul of a thief today. It puts a lie to a lot of things. Baptism, salvation. I've heard people say, you got to get baptized to be saved. That's not in your book. It, there's an emphasis on baptism, but never says baptism saves me. I'm saved by grace. Amen? That's how I'm saved. So I, I thank God for the water, but God saved me, and it, the baptism shows that he saved me. Soul sleep, rest in peace. I, I have not put an RIP, and I'm not, I'm not getting on to you. It's just the way we think, but I've not put an RIP beside anything since I've learned the gospel. Do you think when you die, you're going to need rest? You need rest here because your body's are wearing out. When you get there, oh, you know, I've, I've done so many funerals. Go rest high upon the mountain. How did I get to the mountain? If I had to climb up there, I'm probably going to need rest. And I'm not trying to put uh, Vince down. It's a good song. But I like, I like uh, Brad Paisley and Sister Dolly. I get where I'm going. I run my fingers through his mane. Me ride a drop of rain. I, that's the kind of song that sounds more Bible to me. Again, I'm not getting on. I just want to. People say, "Well, no, when I die, they're going to be an. I'm going to be an angel." No, you're not. You don't want to be an angel. When angels screw up, they get kicked out. Yeah. Don't be an angel. Angel's not what you want to be. You just want to be his child. That's simple. So, so when I get there, uh, it won't be soul sleep. In other words, when I die, I'm not going to just lay in the grave somewhere until he comes back. It's not going to happen. I'm, I'm going to be immediately with him. I'll be immediately there in the kingdom. There'll be no purgatory. Purgatory is a place where you can go and hang out until somebody can pray or give enough money to get you out. There's no such thing. Amen. And listen, the people I know, they ain't going to pay your way out. You, this is your time to pay now. A redeemer. He died for our sin. The receiver died to sin. The rejecter died in sin. It's, it's our call. Stand with me if you would. If you're able. What would you do with Jesus? I'm very thankful today. Very thank. I'm just there's a gratitude, appreciation for life, for friends, for the gospel. All those things wash off. I was excited about getting here this morning to share with you. Understand these two truths out of this message today. Father, forgive them. Jesus is always standing, interceding for us, praying for us. Uh, he longs to. There, there's something about longing to be with somebody you love, to hang out with them, to do things well. That's how he is. He just wants to be with us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And even if you do know what you're doing, he still forgives you if you ask. Then the second one is today you'll be with me in paradise. That outstretched hand, that moment, I think when that thief heard that, his head, you know, he actually rebukes his buddy over here and says, leave him alone. He's done nothing wrong. Today you'll be with me. My grandmother, Jewel Hayes, brewer you know she's a bootlegger laying on her deathbed I still have vivid memories of this I went in and I talked with her and I said grandma it's the hardest thing in the world to talk to somebody you love about heaven and hell it's just so difficult it's like you know they know you you know they know everything you've done and here you're going to come in and talk to them about heaven but you got to do it you got to do it. And it, it's not that I, I won't, but you got to do it. You got to talk to them. 
You got, you got to have that. When, when I go in to do a funeral, I got to know. I, I, I want to know, are they good? Did you talk with them? Well, pastor, and it's hard. You'll beat yourself up. You'll beat yourself I promise you. So you got to do it. So I went out and said, Granny, uh, do you know? And I'm in my uh, mid-20s. Do you know? Because I don't know. Granny, I've been away from you a long time. She's laying. She's ate up with cancer. And she said, Jerry, she loved me. I'm, you know, I'm, her, I'm her grandson. Jerry, I, I would pray, but I was told my whole life that God won't hear sinners. And here's a woman whose own son was shot and killed by her husband. Here's a woman whose daughter, a couple years before then, took a 38 put it to her chest and pulled the trigger here's a woman who has gone through the most difficulties of life and now it's almost over and I looked at her and I said grandma if God don't hear sinners we're all in trouble if he doesn't hear us we're all in trouble and she said well in that case would you pray with me it's so simple. I said, Grandma, with the little words you got left, repeat after me. And I'm standing on the confidence of today, you'll be with me in paradise. Had I not known the word, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But knowing that word, that if you can give a thief a chance, then my bootlegging grandma, who's been through hell on earth, she got a chance to. Yeah, that's right. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross, for forgiveness. Thank you that on a today I can be forgiven. And if anything happens, I will be with you in the kingdom. I honor you today. I thank you for the abundant life you've given me, the opportunity to live for you. Give me a tenacity, a desire, an ability to endure whatever this life throws. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, bless the Lord. Bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Amen. Well, that was more instruction than it was preaching, wasn't it? Uh, it's good, man. Maybe we need a little instruction. Yeah. A little help with that. Uh, you may be seated for a brief moment. Joseph's coming up. Our servant leader's also coming up. Again, if you're, if you're giving today on your phone, just kind of throw your phone up at them. Don't throw your phone at them like I heard, but just, just wave it at them. And if you need to offer an envelope, your faithfulness is so important in this house. You're giving, lift your hand. 